morning, everyone. It's so energizing to be here with all of you. After what we've gone through for the last few years, isn't it wonderful to just have the opportunity to be together, to have dinner together, to have conversations like this? It's really wonderful. And I just want to thank all of you for making the journey from wherever you came to come here and spend some of your valuable time with us, hear our story, and, and ask some questions, get to know us a little bit better. So Rick Butel, um, I joined Bloom in January of this year after 31 years at Air Products. Uh, my last several years were developing very, very large hydrogen and syngas projects in the Americas. Uh, bolted onto many of those projects were clean ammonia and renewable diesel. And when I looked at Bloom's platform, and you've heard Sherilyn and KR and Greg talk about platform, and, and I'm gonna talk about platform a lot. You look at the applicability of Bloom's platform to high temperature process that's gonna be used to synthesize and manufacture all of these fuels of the future, whether it's low carbon intensity ammonia, whether it's methanol, renewable fuels like sustainable aviation fuel, renewable diesel, or even hydrogen itself. Our platform, because it runs at a high temperature, is the most efficient way to make clean hydrogen from electricity. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but all of those processes run at high temperatures. We integrate extraordinarily well, and it gives us a 15 to 30% advantage over competing electrolyzer technologies. The technology platform and its applicability to the growth of these fuels of the future is why I came to Bloom. And I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you, not just about hydrogen, but also carbon capture. Uh, personally, I believe that in the long run, by 2050, there will be a trend of everything will be electrified or everything will be fueled by hydrogen. There's a long time between now and 2050. And natural gas, particularly in regions where it's abundant, like the country we're sitting in right now, or our neighbors to the north and south, uh, is going to play an incredibly important role in continuing to supply mankind's energy needs, particularly considering the abundant sequestration geology that we're blessed with uh, and we understand quite well from decades of oil and gas exploration. So I'm going to talk to you about hydrogen. I'm going to talk to you about carbon capture as soon as the slide advance. I spoke about we have the most efficient electrolysis technology. Probably all of us have really tried hard to forget our high school chemistry classes, our high school physics classes, our college thermodynamics classes. I know I have. But it's a matter of simple chemistry and simple thermodynamics. Our device runs at 800 degrees C, give or take. Because it runs at such a high temperature, we need to input less electricity to produce a kilogram, a normal cubic meter, a standard cubic foot of hydrogen than low temperature electrolysis technologies like PEM and alkaline. And I really mentioned earlier, one of the things that best suits our platform are the synthesis of these fuels of the future. And right now, we don't need to make any bets as to whether methanol is going to succeed over ammonia, or is it going to be renewable diesel made from beef tallow and used cooking oil, or is it going to be sustainable aviation fuel, or is it going to be the hydrogen molecule itself? because our technology is the best route to hydrogen compared to any other way of doing this if you want to do it truly cleanly. I spoke about carbon capture. I've done some carbon capture projects in my past life. I did a very, very large one in Louisiana, also one in Edmonton, Alberta. Our technology already, all of the 700 megawatts of installed base that we have out there in power generation, already emits an anode gas stream which is very, very rich in carbon dioxide. And further on in the presentation, I'm gonna talk about how this proven technology, which is in every device that we've built and all the devices we're going to be built, can be very, very simply modified with some piping connections so that we can work with partners, as Sherilyn talked about, to either use that carbon dioxide for beneficial purposes like food and beverage, or to sequester that carbon dioxide and produce 24-7 zero carbon intensity power, which is of value in many industries today, but I think ultimately in the long term, we all acknowledge we're going to need 24-7 zero carbon power to limit temperature rise to hopefully one and a half degrees. Just a further thought on that, I don't know how many of you may have gone to Sarah Week this year uh, and listened to Secretary Granthalm 
and Special Environmental Envoy Kerry uh, speak about the challenges of holding one and a half degrees C and how we're going to need all of these technologies. I would have to say it was wonderful, A, to be back at Sarah Week and, and bond with the community in the energy industry again. But you would have been not terribly mistaken to think that it was a hydrogen and carbon capture conference, not necessarily a global energy conference. And the last Sarah Week that I went to, I guess, was 2019. Yes, hydrogen's important. But people that were talking to us about hydrogen at that time, what did they want to know? And what did they want in hydrogen? They wanted hydrogen that was cheap, and they wanted hydrogen that was reliable. Why? Because they're running barrels through their refinery, or they're making ammonia. In the last two years, our collective consciousness has changed. And now every conversation with respect to hydrogen is how are you making the hydrogen? And what is the environmental footprint of that hydrogen production? And if it's electrolysis, how efficient is it? Where's the electricity coming from? If it's so-called blue hydrogen, right, where you start with natural gas and you sequester the CO2, how are you doing that? Can you get a class six well permit? What does the geology look like? Are you certain that that hydrogen, once you shove it 7,000 feet underground, is actually going to stay there, right? And what safeguards are you putting in place to do that? So it's really fascinating to me, and I'll bring it back to carbon capture before I move on to the slide. With the 45Q tax credit, even at the current level of $50 a ton, we are very, very close, and I'll walk through economics, to parity with combined cycle um, with uh, anode gas carbon capture from our fuel cell if it's sequestered. And that's, again, for 24-7, zero carbon intensity power that doesn't depend on if the sun's shining, if the wind's blowing, or there was a lot of snow the winter before that's going to you know, melt and um, have robust flow in streams. Really, this slide should say, why are we confident that with our technology, we're going to meet or exceed what we have all looked at in terms of a forecast for our market penetration in hydrogen and our growth in hydrogen. And what I would pose to this group is that three quarters of the applications for low carbon intensity hydrogen, clean hydrogen, I'll use colors, I'm not personally in favor of using colors, but fine, green or pink hydrogen. Three quarters of the applications are high temperature applications. Our device is a high temperature device. The customers, our hosts, the people that are going to buy hydrogen from us that are running exothermic processes, and again, you know, high school chemistry, we've all tried to forget that, but processes that give off heat in addition to making a molecule of renewable diesel or a molecule of ammonia. We can take the value of that heat, quite simply, and not feed water into our electrolyzer, as every electrolyzer company does, and, and we can take water. But if we're able to feed steam into our electrolyzer, really, to me, that is the game changer. That gives us a specific power, again, kilowatt hours of electric energy per kilogram of hydrogen that's 30% or more more efficient than competing technologies, than low temperature technologies. All of these segments, I said it, it's the fuels of the future, sustainable aviation fuel, renewable diesel, ammonia, we don't care what wins. We're hedged to all of these. Um, whatever wins, we have the killer application to deliver it. And even sort of historically sleepy segments, steel production. Steel making isn't going anywhere. If you look at all of the infrastructure, in this country and around the world that needs to be replaced. Zero carbon steel is going to be trading at a premium in the future. Similarly, other hard to decarbonize segments like cement, the cement industry very focused in looking at this. You can deal with a third of the challenge of producing cement from clinker with hydrogen, using hydrogen as a fuel, as opposed to really, really dirty fuels like, no kidding, like bunker, scrap tires, pet coke, I mean, you can imagine the combustion CO2 footprint, and not just the CO2 footprint, right? All the other nasties that go up the stack when you're using waste fuels like that. So three quarters of the applications we're dialed in for. And these are all applications that are going to remain where they are, or most likely going to grow. And finally, one more thought on this slide. Everybody's got their own forecast of how much hydrogen's going to be required, right? I like the IEA's one. 
Uh, Bloom is now a member of the Global Hydrogen Council, and actually there's a meeting of the Global Hydrogen Council next week in Washington, D.C. They just issued a new forecast. Of course, it's going up. Unless you have a crystal ball, you don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be tremendously large, and we're very well positioned to capture it. We are more efficient than low temperature technologies. This is a view based on today's costs. Three quarters of the cost of making clean hydrogen is the electricity itself. Our efficiency, if we're fed with steam, is under 40 kilowatt hours per kilogram. And that casts a longer shadow than every other component in the equation. I'm not saying capital cost isn't important. I'm not saying O&M cost isn't important. I'm not saying that any other facet, whether it's degradation or efficiency, and, and by the way, during our stack lifetime, unlike PEM and alkaline, we don't lose capacity, we don't lose efficiency, we're level steady eddy during the life of the analysis. But no matter how you slice it, efficiency carries the day. And whether it's with steam, as I spoke of, if you're integrating with a high temperature customer process, or we're fed with water, because not every process on the planet is a high temperature process. We're markedly better than competing technologies like PEM and alkaline. And I'll just riff for a moment on something that Greg said. We also don't have iridium in our box. We also don't have platinum in our box. Everything in there is not a rare earth metal. It's nothing that you know, we don't have difficulty finding. It's all dual sourced. And to the best of my knowledge, Satish, I don't think any of it comes from Russia or the Ukraine. Thank you. So we talked about efficiency. So I'm not going to beat that to death any further. Proven performance. We've got 700 megawatts of fuel cells out there operating today. It's going to be a gigawatt by the end of the calendar year. If you were to do electrolysis equivalent of that installed base, that's almost two and a half gigawatts. Manufacturing platform. I hope everyone got the opportunity to walk around and see this beautiful factory that's just been built, all the tools and equipment that's moving in. The manufacturing platform for electrolysis is identical to the manufacturing platform for fuel cell, which Bloom have been practicing for 15 years. The factory is flexible. The order book in a given month, if it's 100% fuel cell, that's what the factory builds. If the next week we sell an electrolyzer to an ammonia producer, and we need to adjust and say, OK, we're going to cram an electrolyzer into it. It's real-time adjustable. It's the same materials. It's the same platform. It's the same inks. All of the know-how, all of the IP that has been developed with respect to fuel cell is directly applicable to electrolysis. And finally, I come from the big hydrogen world. Our modular approach in terms of what it offers the customer in terms of, we speak about it in electricity terms, in electrons, as resiliency. In the molecule world, we think of that as availability. And so if you're building a steam reformer, if you're building an autothermal reformer, you're very happy to get 97 or 98% availability. With our modular architecture and a number of stacks all operating in parallel, as a minimum, you can expect two nines availability, but our fuel cell experience has been five nines availability, and that just does not exist in the process plant world. It's really, really a compelling story. Where are we? So we launched the product in 2021. We have done a series of small-scale demonstrations, and happy to speak in some more detail about that with anyone uh, in the room. We uh, are now in the process of launching 10 megawatt demonstrations. And actually, we just announced fortuitously this morning that we were able to reach agreement with an ammonia producer, LSB Industries. Uh, we also are talking to other customers in other segments, such as refining and renewable fuels, and the nuclear industry, who are all focused on getting to clean hydrogen. As we get through that in 2022, we deploy those units in late 22, early 23. Really, that's like the final set of pre-production cars that go down the line. And we work the bugs out. And then we're ready for large orders starting in the second half of 2023. And my view, personally, is that the world will be ready for that with us because they'll be able to go look, see, touch, feel, see the efficiency, talk to the operators, understand the resiliency, understand the availability. 
and that is going to be a big differentiator for us and it's going to supercharge our efforts in this segment. I'll spend some time on carbon capture. What I'd like you to think about with respect to bloom and carbon capture compared to conventional power production. So for example, with a combined cycle gas turbine. If you look at the exhaust of a combined cycle gas turbine compared to the exhaust that comes out of our fuel cell, much higher CO2 concentration, right? We're over 50% CO2 in the exhaust in a combined cycle facility, that might be 4%. Much less mass flow, because we don't have all that nitrogen that's just going along for the ride. So what does that mean? That means if you're trying to get to CO2 that you can do something with and take economic advantage of it, whether it's sequestration with a $50.45Q or God willing in the future an $85.45Q, or you're looking to commercialize it and do something with it, it's much less energy to purify it because you're starting with a much higher concentration of CO2. And it's also little silly things in the EPC, right? Like the pipes are a lot smaller, so you also put a lot less capex into the ground. Getting from our 52% CO2 stream that comes out of the exhaust of the box, about 40% is also water. Really easy to knock that water out. Dehydration, very, very mature technology. The other technologies to go to 95% or 99% or greater that's sequesterable or usable as industrial grade CO2 for food and beverage or heat treating or other applications, all very mature technologies, very well known, practiced for decades. These are all things mankind knows how to do. Evidently, it's not what I know how to do. Advance the, uh, the clicker here. So I spoke about combined cycle, dirty power, gray power, the power we're all probably using in our homes and businesses. Six cents a kilowatt hour. Now that's subject to $3 gas, yada, yada, yada. Levelized. If you were to try and capture the exhaust of that and sequester it and get the 45Q benefit, that six cents a kilowatt hour jumps to about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. With Bloom, because of the concentration in CO2 in our exhaust and the ease of making that sequesterable, our number is very, very close, six and a half cents. And again, that's for 24 seven green power. I guess it'd be blue power, 24 seven carbon free power. How about that? We'll settle on that as a compromise. It's much simpler because we're starting with a higher purity stream. It's very scalable. We can fit 100 megawatts of power generation in about an acre. And what does that unlock? That unlocks very low barriers to siting, right? What do you need to be near in order to site this and do carbon capture? Really, you either need to be near the hole in the ground or a pipeline to the hole in the ground to sequestration. But from a placement of these assets standpoint, because we have no knocks, no socks, no particulates, it's quiet. They're actually pretty good looking, right? I think you guys probably saw what the boxes look like. I mean, I think they're aesthetically pleasing. Very low barriers to siting. Two more points. Who are we gonna sell this stuff to, right? So the people that are coming to us now and asking us questions about this today are people that are manufacturing products that are traded on their carbon intensity. Cheryl Lynn talked about renewable diesel. And even our base platform without carbon capture is significantly more efficient than the grid from a CO2 perspective. If you add carbon capture, and you're able to take the benefit of the 45Q into your economic calculation, you get to zero carbon power. And then your ammonia, your renewable diesel, your SAF, your methanol, you can sell it at a much higher premium. And Greg said it, Cheryl Lynn said it, and now we're value selling. We're not just competing against a grid. We can put some of that margin in our pocket. I think ultimately, it would be hard for any of us to disagree that we all need 24-7 zero carbon power. That's a fact. With Bloom, that can be done economically. And again, we don't depend on is the sun shining, is the wind blowing, did it snow last winter, can you get a nuclear permit? Thank you very much. <laughs>